This is Pete Moore on Halo Talks NYC. I have the pleasure of having serial entrepreneur Derek from Ness, who's going to explain to us first. Ness with the Loch Ness Monster, living in a lake at Lake House Ventures, might be the greatest monster of all time. So with that kickoff, I will let you go through your background and we will roll from there. Sure. You, you, you got it, Pete. Um... I'm uh, glad to be here. Appreciate your time as well. And I'm excited to share more about Ness. Um, you want me to give the quick quick spiel on what the heck we're building? Do. Yep, that'd be great. Yeah, great. Um, so the story really starts with my first company uh, called Greatest. I started six months out of college. Uh, I grew up a really big kid, struggling in my weight. And so I'm very kind of heart vision, you know, mission driven entrepreneur. Uh, with my first company, I had no clue what I was doing, but I was deeply and profoundly passionate around making uh, the idea of health and wellness more accessible because I felt growing up like everything that was out there was for people who had six pack abs already and went to Paltrow. And uh, let, me, let me ask you one question about yeah. growing up. So there used to be a section in Sears called the Husky department for kids that yeah. were elastic jeans and it said Husky. And I always dreaded going there with my mom. Um, because I was a pretty chubby kid too. I had access to yeah. the, uh, to the change bin and ice cream, man. Um, and then used to eat a, a, a you know, a meatball hero before a, uh, oh, basketball gosh. game as if we knew anything about nutrition. Um, yeah, my, my parents, uh, my mom is, uh, you know, was born in, in, in Russia and, um, I just, nobody had any clue. And I drank, I hurt my hand actually. This is like the backstory is I, when I was uh, eight, nine years old, I, I hurt my hand and I ended up with my right arm in a cast for four years, uh, three wow. surgeries over four years. And I'm right handed. Oh uh, and so basically, you know, in the ages when guys make um, friends and play sports, I did neither. And uh, instead, I just drank a lot of Dr. Pepper and read a lot of books. With your left, um, with your left hand? Right, exactly. Uh, and Look, I think that the Dr. Pepper thing didn't pay off, but the book sure did. (laughs) And uh, it was really, you know, it was kind of after all this that I decided I didn't want to be the biggest kid in the class. And it's through sort of the struggle, uh, which became a passion point for me, uh, you know, that it sort of drove me to that, yeah, that first company. And, you know, just to kind of round that out, at Greatest, uh, we ended up building the largest site on the internet for millennials who care about their health. Me and some friends thought it'd be a smart idea to start writing content in health and wellness that wasn't total trash. And Google sort of woke up at the time to embracing content that was written, uh, fact-checked, and expert-approved. Um, and everything we wrote was written in the voice of a friend that was a little further along. So it was high-quality content you actually would engage with and like reading. And we kind of did that at the right time and ended up building an audience of 15 million people every month reading our content, 2 million people on an email list we mailed every single day. Pretty, pretty wild pretty wild, uh, you know, audience journey. Um, yeah. Can I ask you a couple of questions about that experience? You know, you said you didn't sure. know what you're doing, which most people don't uh, when they're trying to solve a personal frustration and turn into well, a everyone business. Everyone had it all figured out, Pete. Yeah, yeah, right. There's a playbook, you know, you could, you could get it off uh, the internet. Yeah. Well, time to win again. You could, you could see if mine might work, but then you might build a sports team by accident. Um, so the question is, you know, you didn't know what you're doing at first, but, you know, obviously you did it for eight years. You got 15 million people. Um, as your audience. So a couple of things related to that. Can you talk about maybe the sequencing of hiring? Because I think a lot of you know entrepreneurs struggle with who do I bring in next after yeah. myself and maybe one or two people on the development side. Um, and then also talk about, you know, is there's anything you could do over again with that? You know, what would be the one or two, you know, mm. inflection moves? Yeah, I mean, I think we probably shouldn't dwell too much on my last company because the way I like to talk about it is um, that I kind of like the best way I learn is to make the mistakes myself. And I learned made a lot of mistakes. I joked the other day that I learned too much from my last Mm. company, but uh, I would definitely not recommend doing what I did for hiring in the first few years. Greatest was quite a journey. Uh, uh, we, we raised a lot of money. We were sort of this media company at a time, a very brief period of time when VCs were into media companies. We raised a bunch of money, doubled down on the media portion, and ended up building a, a you know pretty successful, big, growing media company, um, which is which is great, and ended up having a really really nice outcome. Um, we sold to Healthline in 2019, uh, but it was after a roller coaster ride of you know ups and downs, um, and I learned how to 
build a business, build a team, build a culture. Uh, and I look back on it with a lot of pride because of the value and sort of the role the brand played. But I'll be frank, now when I'm starting my second business, I mostly reflect back on it in gratitude for the lessons that I learned so that I can be a slightly better this time. Sure. Um, you know, in terms of building a team, I'm like a very people first CEO. I, I don't think all CEOs are that way, but I tend to think people and culture are crucial. And basically, I've never really had a job for like my last job was like six months, you know, right before I started my first company. So uh, because of that, I kind of accidentally created a culture and a way to think about teams that um, you know, I didn't know any other way. <laughs> so um, I think we did a lot of things right because of that, actually. Um, mm -hmm. The biggest lessons learned, though, that I've applied to NAS, uh, my new company, uh, is just a continued emphasis on the people themselves. But in particular, sort of the thing that always surprises people is I love recruiters. Um, this is when I reflected back on the best people. You know, we had nearly 100 people when we sold the business, uh, full-time people when we sold the company, um, uh, greatest. And uh, when I was kind of I spent a lot of time reflecting on who were the best people and how did they come to me. I was pretty surprised to learn that actually the vast majority of the best people on our team came from recruiters. And in almost all the cases, I, I had wished I had hired them three to six months earlier. Um, mm -hmm. But it was my sort of hubris that I could find these people myself, which I think is frankly very rarely true, except in the very early stages of the business where really you're building off of pre-existing relationships. And so one of my kind of most counterintuitive pieces of advice I give to founders is use recruiters. Uh, think of it not as a tax on hiring someone great, but actually the, the speeding cost. You know, it's like a, you're basically, you know, allowed to kind of skip and go ahead faster. So think of it as mm -hmm. like a boost. Uh, and I also find recruiters really help you understand, especially when you're hiring for roles that you might not have hired for before, really help you understand what you need in the first place right. and think of them as advisors as well, sort of managing and, and kind of shaping your decision. That's, that's great advice. I mean, you know, the, the companies we work with, sometimes they'll throw up a, uh, you know, job description on, on Indeed. And right. you've got a five mile radius of, of people working at other entities that that's the recruiting effort is like yeah. beyond the ground. Uh, that, that's great advice. So, yeah, I, mean, I have lots of lots of other learnings, uh, but that one that one's the one that always seems to surprise people. Uh, yeah. I'm a real sucker for core values. We're very intense about how we uh, interview people and have a really very intense process tied to the core values. So with every interview we do, we're actually uh, measuring and assessing people on whether they fit in the uh, with the type of culture we have and intend to have. Um, we're very kind of anal about it, frankly. Um, and that's really paid off. Um, you know, we, we think that that increases the quality, the caliber that people are hiring and their likelihood of success meaningfully better. That's awesome. All right, let's move on to Ness. Let's do it. Um, so after I sold Greatest, um, you know, and I, I think of it really like as, this is like why I feel I'm on, like believe I'm on this planet, honestly, is to like democratize access to health. It's, it's I feel blessed to have kind of discovered that. And I think of Greatest, my first company, is really that first attempt. And there, the idea was to sort of make health and wellness more accessible. Um, the idea, the narrative around health and wellness more accessible, but there's just no denying that no matter how friendly you make health and wellness, um, it still is very expensive and hard to afford for most people. And I was um, hit sort of smack in the face with this about a year and a half ago, which was about a year and a half after I sold my last company. Um, in between, I sort of advised and consulted with a bunch of different healthcare companies. I sort of felt like my, um, felt like my frankly, like skill set around consumer, building an audience, building a brand, marketing, um, and building a team uh, were areas in which healthcare was the most suffering uh, for and that I could make the biggest impact in. And, um, and so I started to kind of, well, I worked with a lot of amazing companies in healthcare, uh, like, you know, GoodRx and Galileo Health and Levels Health and Peloton and all these different companies um, as sort of an advisor and investor. And um, then I felt like myself again, and here I was struggling to get health insurance to pay for me to see my therapist, I'm a big believer in therapy and mental health. And I couldn't understand why in the midst of COVID, health insurance wouldn't pay for me to do this thing that everyone agrees is good for you, essentially. 
And so I started to explore why doesn't health insurance really pay for any of the things that are supposed to be good for you, eating well and working out and taking vitamin D, mental health. Why is it uh, that health insurance, which seems like it should care about your long-term health, actually doesn't? And what I discovered was that uh, the answer is actually very simple, which is in this country, unlike almost any other country, uh, we the majority of people get health insurance from their employer. Uh, and people have never stayed with employers for a shorter period of time. And because of that, from the health plan's perspective, it turns out that the average customer sticks to the health insurance plan for just three to four years. And so any dollar spent on your fifth or your 15th year of your health is not just money wasted, but almost gifted to the competition because the likeliest outcome is you'll join another company and probably join a competitor health plan. Uh, oh, so, so you're basically delivering, you're delivering healthier people to, but well, you want to deliver healthier people, uh, but you're actually delivering, you know, the, the wrong people and it's not going to be their problem. Yeah, the point is, the point is actually really that the incentives in the space, in the system, as we currently understand them are broken that there's a disincentive to, for health plans to actually care about your long-term health and that that leads to the health inequity and um, frankly, like tragic outcomes we have where so many people who actually want health and wellness, there's never been more people who do, can't access it. And so me and some friends, some prior backers and supporters um, started to work on, could you create a health insurance plan that would stick with people long enough that you could actually justify investing in their long-term health in the short term? Finally, you'd stick with me for 30 to 40 years, not three to four. I'd pay for your gym membership all day and for your healthy sure. food because you'd be so much healthier later. And so we ended up landing on kind of a unique wedge, which is you know, our kind of crazy, big, interesting swing for the business, which is we ended up landing on the form factor of a credit card as the best way to build a relationship with people to eventually offer them long-term health insurance. Now that's bizarre. I essentially thought I was building a healthcare company and I'm currently building a FinTech company, but we fell in love with this concept of a credit card. For one, credit card has FinTech levers which allow us to actually reduce the cost of wellness sooner. The vision for the business is to actually make, build a world where everyone can afford to be healthy we could actually make good on that sooner rather than later. We didn't have to build this full-fledged health insurance plan yet. We could use interchange from the credit card. We could use fees mm -hmm. on the credit card. We could use affiliate um, to actually like reduce the cost of wellness sooner. Um, that would allow us to build a relationship with people. Credit cards, people tend to stick with for a very long period of time. And we'd have access to people's consumer wallets, essentially a relationship with their consumer wallet, in which not only could we learn from them and help you know, like be through that, right? Help them in theory be healthier. We could directly actually impact behavior change. We could actually drive them to make better decisions by using um, this kind of, you know, unique sort of relationship. And so, so just to, cl to clarify what you're doing, you get the, the card in the hands of consumers. You start to incent them to put all their halo slash yeah. wellness purchases on That's the card. Right. Then you're starting to gather data on what their routines are mind the data, understand it, and then be able to say, okay, this is a healthy person. I'm going to slap a health insurance plan outside of the, the company, but direct to consumer. Yeah. So, so that's, that's nearly exactly right. So we're building, we think of it as like an annex for health. So the plan is right. to launch a whole series and suite of cards, credit cards, that instead of rewarding you for travel, like most credit cards do, uh, at a premium level, we'll reward you with health and wellness. You'll get more bang for your buck because health and wellness has better, higher margins than travel, frankly. Um, and uh, if you care about health and wellness, we believe health and wellness is now the number one lifestyle identity in this country and no longer travel. I know I'm not alone in believing that on this call. Um, sure. If that's true, shouldn't you use a card that fit, you know, that suits that? And so we think there's a really amazing, huge opportunity to actually build a credit card first, um, sort of so the health and wellness first credit card company, and then. For people who have a choice where they get their health insurance, we want to be the best place that people go. We want to be the choice. And if we can do that, we should actually be able to offer people more affordable health insurance that actually reimburses them for the things they really care about. Um, as long as you have a long term, it could change the system and flip everything upside down in a pretty amazingly profound uh, you know, way. Yeah. One question just for, for the entrepreneurs that are in fintech or, or not, do the rewards and points build up? Is that funded by the credit card company? Is it funded by 
the uh, affiliates and, and partners, you know, I know you've got Sweet Greens and, and Barry's Food Camp already on the platform. And I love the way you have the business description because it sounds like great. It's like you're really talking to me as if you're a friend yeah. explaining the business. So I, I get that. Yeah. It, that, very, that came through. Um, how, how does that work, though? Because I think a lot of groups would pay for reward systems because they do that in the health club industry with Perkville and a couple other reward yeah. systems that get you to the points. But it, the points are only used inside the club. And now the club's basically giving away revenue where it should yeah. be external partners. So it was just gloss so over the that way, first the way it works. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. It's a great question. So the way that uh, credit cards and debit cards work in this country is there's actually a locked-in interchange rate. Uh, and that interchange rate, let's assume it's 1% to 2% loosely. And there's a bunch of partners who like nibble at it and take parts of it. Probably the most famous ones are the networks, like a Visa or a MasterCard. But you know, they're taking tiny, tiny fractions now of every transaction. But it's basically if you can get people to spend on your credit card, which is a big if, to be clear, right? We believe we're very confident that we'll be able to move the spend. And, you know, um, we, we think we have a lot of reasons for why people will do that, um, both emotional and literally just logical and financial. Um, but at a very basic level, if you can get people to spend, you collect loosely 1% to 2% of every single transaction. And that percentage, by the way, is built in to the cost of everything you're purchasing already. Because effectively, that really comes out of the merchant. Got it. Um, affiliate is a very similar concept because it's already built in to the products themselves, that percentage then might go to whoever sort of like acquired the customer or sent them, but effectively it's the same idea. Um, we are using both, right, in our products to come to be able to offer amazing products and services, um, but we're also using it to build a good business. Got it. You know, when you think about, you know, the health clubs and the amount of people that they sign up on an annual basis and the churn in the industry, which, we like to say is 3% a month and it's really five to 6% a month. Um, so the opportunity, you know, when you go on a plane, they're still always, you know, trying to hawk a credit card, you know, by the yeah. uh, flight attendant, every single flight. Uh, I don't know what their receptivity is on those. I feel like that's kind of lost. It's lost. Low, um, I imagine. Right. Yeah. But if you, but, if you, by the way, if you look at all the, all the publicly traded, um, if you look at all the publicly traded, um, airlines that have credit card programs. The credit card programs are more profitable than the travel itself. Yeah, that's a great knowledge Isn't that point. Crazy. So, so take like Planet Fitness as an example, uh, or let's take LA Fitness that has 500 clubs, give or take, you know, three million members. Um, they're 20 percent of the sales are done online, but 80 percent are done in person. Mm -hmm. um, so, so do you see? The health clubs or the franchise wars is basically, you know, almost like a multi-level marketing sales channel to get people that are actually already spending money. We in the have sector. people sign up for credit cards literally everywhere. <laughs> I mean, okay. we want to be in every sweet green. We want to be in every LA fitness. Um, we want that to be a way people see us and we'll drive them obviously to sign up, you know, using our mobile apps and, and everything. You so, Derek, we're, we're going to make a statement real quick. This is the last podcast, and we're going to work for Ness. So, Go thanks ahead. for listening. We're done. I don't know what number this is. Three. Tell, you'll tell me what the plug is. Three seventy-five. We're done. We're, done. we're getting you, into you in. Halo uh, wellness credit card <laughs> business, and I'm going I'm to have done. Ness. Now you guys are so I got to get to the cultural interview, though. I'm concerned <laughs> about the cultural <laughs> interview. It's a, it's tough. Um, we have to make sure that you work crispy and, and pencil it in those are some of our core values. Um, <laughs> yeah, love it. The, um, yeah, look, it's a big swing. Yeah. Like in the world of venture capital swings, this is a big swing. It's why we've already raised fifteen and a half million dollars. It's why we're going to raise a lot more. Um, mm -hmm. And that's because competing with the Chase and Amexes of the world is not easy. Uh, and then competing with uh, United and Aetna isn't easy either. And so, you know, we're a fintech wedge into healthcare. I, I, you know, we didn't go into this lightly. We genuinely believe that this is um, the most likely wedge into the space to succeed. And the world where, again, more people than ever have a choice where they get their health insurance. I believe essentially what we're really competing against is the fact that most people get health insurance from their employer. And that misaligns the sentence. We believe today people have, there are more people in this country who have a choice where they get their health insurance than ever before. There are more people who are self-employed and freelance 
Um, there are more people who work for companies that are offering pre-tax dollars to choose whatever plan you want. And there are, and, and frankly, like there are more people who have chosen not to get health insurance and uh, are ineligible for like a Medicare or Medicaid. They just, it's confusing, the open exchange, and they don't see what value it gives them. We think yeah, that's one, one, you know, one question related to that, you know, do you know, have you done research on how many employers actually give a credit card? To their employees for expenses i'm sure it's been reduced you know mm -hmm. over time for compliance reasons but the whole banking industry used to give you an amex card yeah, to sure. analysts associates and up uh and i wonder if that you know is a way for an employer to say look not only do i care about your health but this card now is going to not give you you know points because they usually keep the points i think i don't know how that works yeah, look, i think i think in the employer is a is a big opportunity for us eventually i think we need to prove our way there and I'm a consumer guy, and I think if we can win with consumers, the rest actually becomes a lot easier. Yeah. Um, I will say that we use the competitors to Amex and Cap One and some of these other uh, cards in employers. We use Brex and Ramp and Divi as good examples. Because sometimes people go, I don't understand why people will sign up for your card when they're so comfortable with the cards they already have. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, look look at what's happening in nearly every other niche and look at what's happening in employers where they've signed up and replaced their Amex and Chase cards with what years ago were just truly unknown companies like Rex and Rezzy, who are all now huge, amazing, like unicorns. Um, I think actually it's one of the easiest switches to make, frankly. If I can make the case that it's better for you uh, and more aligned with your identity, we're very confident people will not just sign up for a card, um, but uh, spend a lot on it. Um, yeah. And uh, if we can use that to actually drive them to spend on better things, the impact that it can have is pretty tremendous. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's a great entry point. It seems unique to me. Having that in someone's wallet who already spends on all their Halo, you know, there's no connectivity right now with my, my spend and what I spend on. Uh, it's always something as an alternative. So uh, yeah, last right. question here in, in, in closing. Um, well, two questions. One, how did you land on the 15-5, given that you're in a horse race? And, you know, what, what was digestible to you to, to land with that number? Because a lot of these deals, you know, it's interesting to see what number they come up with as, as the race. And then the last is if you have any uh, business quotes or things that you live by, um, you know, that we could add to our uh, library. Yeah, sure. Um, how do we land on that number? We felt it was the right number we needed to get to our next milestone. I mean, to put it, you know, frankly, um, and uh, you know, we're, we're raising more. We'll we'll basically always be raising more um, as we want to get to our big milestones, bigger and better. Cool. Um, I have two quotes for you. Um, two quotes from kind of very different like ways of thinking that uh, I reflect on a lot. The first is from one of my favorite authors that I read a lot of when I was uh, a kid growing up, um, Ray Bradbury, uh, one of, I think, the truly sort of like genius um, storytellers. Um, there's a quote he gives about jump off the cliff and build your wings on the way down. I think a lot about sort of the taking risks, you know? I, I am a, a very, conservative person in most other aspects of my life, but I bet my professional career on huge, huge, very uh, calculated risks. Um, and uh, no one's ever built a health and wellness credit card as a wedge into healthcare. And so I think a lot about that. And then the other quote is from this guy, Shogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, um, a, um, you know, again, a very like, you know, we're talking now about like Buddhist, you know, Buddhist sort of methodology but his quote uh, is, the bad news is you are falling through the air, nothing to hang on to, no parachute. The good news is there is no ground. Um, hmm. And it's like, you know, you got to like jump off the cliff, right? And yes, you're on a timetable. But in reality, right, it's like you get to decide, you know, the constraints on what you're building. And um, I don't know, I find both of those kind of very different they're kind of saying the same thing, but framed in very different, powerful ways. And that helps so, guide so, you. So one, you're on a cliff that's got uh, that, that's high up in the sky. So keep doing what you're doing. And mm -hmm. on the halo side, you're using the, the term wellness, and we're okay with that for now. Uh, but halo gives you wings, right? So 
the wings that you need for the parachute to jump off that cliff. We are with you. If this is the last podcast, thanks for listening. Otherwise, we will catch you on the next credit card, and it'll say everything you need in Halo is on this card. So we yeah. want to be a party part of this, and uh, you know we love the jump you're taking, and uh, yeah. I think we got to we, we got to say this, this could be big, baby. <laughs> yeah. this, this could be big, absolutely. Right, uh, thank, good thank to, you, good both. to talk Appreciate to you. Appreciate the time. Right. Thanks, man. That was great.